do we really want to expose ourselves? Fortunately, we found a partner in Mr. Amit Mehta who used to lead the market because he used to represent Indian Kalai in the old days to sell a few units. He was only the marketing, uh, he was a marketing training person. He had no knowledge of production and stuff like that. So that was a good combination. So one good lesson to be learned here is partner with somebody who has complementary strengths. Some, something you don't know, he knows. And you know something, so you match your strengths. And that worked. Because he had confidence, we tied up and said, okay, we go 50-50 into this business. Let's look at it carefully. Baroda, I am currently in number country. I went to Baroda. My colleague was also in my job. Sameer Khan. Two of us went to have a look at the chat. And they welcomed us. They put up a presentation. We received their numbers. We did a little bit back of the calculation. And I remember the airport. Sameer was brooding over the whole thing. He's the chemical engineer. I'm just the management guy. I don't know who follows up. He's the real brain. <laughs> Looked at it and told me, okay, this doesn't make sense. You know, the return is so poor, you'll never ask this. So I'm supposed to be the finance guy who wants bottom line first. <laughs> so I said, okay, let's put it together and go back to Bombay and present it to the boss and say that, look, this is what we promised. So I remember this was a Saturday we met in a conference room. We're all there, Samir, so myself, my boss, my general manager, process engineering, and the finance guy from Amit Mehta. Mr. Amit Mehta was late, so by the time he came in, we had made a small presentation to my boss. And when he came in, my boss told me, Hey, Amit, come in here. So he said, Oh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm late. He said, No, you're not late. This thing is not going to work, so just have a cup of tea. That's <laughs> it. <laughs> then he said, Okay, uh, but since you've already done that, let me see what it is. And we went for a whole presentation again. And then this is where you need to learn to ask the questions. And they said, okay, this is giving you a rate of return of minus 2%. What is our baseline for acceptance? We said, minimum 25% I have. In those days, inflation rate times, even today, I think. In India, it's 25%. Right. The risks are very high. This is very high globally, but in India, because the risks of business are so high, an acceptable benchmark for IR for a new product is 25% plus. And so we looked at that and said, okay, how do we make this project 25% higher? And really, when you look back, it's on, it looks so simple. You lower costs, you lower capital expenditure, you increase volumes of sales. Simple book, book method. But how do you do it in real life? That's a class. The one thing is you learn is never assume anything. The foreign partner was Dow, Dow Chemicals. At that time it was separate from Union Bar. They had given a price for our union for the cuisine, which was X dollars. And we said, why not ask them if they can lower it? And uh, he said, why would you lower it? I mean, that's the market price. I said, no, but who knows? You, know, you may have gone to do business in India. Who knows? Let's try it. Second is, let's have a look. They have said we need to invest seven crores in capital equipment. Let's have a look. <laughs> so, a couple of, uh, we brought out a professor, Jimmy Koshi, who is the director of UBCT. He came to us, this is a classmate of my boss. So, okay. so we got him along to Baroda and said, this is the plan. And all the professor did was ask questions. Why do you have this column doing this? Why do you have that column doing this dissertation? Why can't this be done like this? He never answered the questions. He just asked the questions. And we had never asked those questions. Why is this material of construction stainless steel? We had no idea what that really means. We were the, supposed to be the experts. 
still is an actor, and if your network gets half, or there is a continuous loss of three years, yeah. you are obliged by the uh, laws of the country to report to the Bureau of Industrial and Financial Reconstruction, which is called BIFR. I think they've got a different name now. Some they've renamed it to something else. But basically, a kind of chapter 11, what they call in the US. And this company had got into that by the time of this happened. And once you get into that, every decision that management takes has to go through BIFR. Because what happens is you get protection from vendors. Vendors can't take you to court on one side. Nobody, the government tax people can't take you to court. Nobody can take you to court so you are right. But on the other side, you can't take operating decisions without checking with them. Now when that happens, no bank is willing to deal with it. <laughs> so how do you import 2,500 tons of <coughs> material in dire means? if they are not able to open LCs. So what we did was we floated a separate, what we call a special purpose vehicle, another company, which was funded by Alcala Mine and SMA. And with our relationship with the banks, we opened the LC and bought the material in our name. So we kept the deadline of Dow. We hired the plant of Dow, uh, of uh, Daniels, saying we lease the plant. Like a wet lease, your people will run the plant we will pay you enough for their salaries and their utilities and all that. And you will process and the finished goods is ours. Till such time as BIFR agrees to hand over money. So the whole structure took a little time, but it went through. And then we sat with the, they had by that time 22 crores of debt, of unpaid dues. 8 crores of term debt, 8 crores of working capital debt, and another 8 crores of unsecured debt, approximately. So we had to sit with all these people because we had told BIFR, give us management and we don't want concessions, which was a shock because we were the first at that time company to go under that section 32A, which said we don't want any concessions because most people went to BIFR. This is India. Everybody goes to BIFR to protect himself. The moment he gets into trouble, then he goes and tells the income tax guy and the excise guy, sorry, I can't pay you, I'm in BIFR. And he keeps control of the company. This is a standard practice which people follow. We were the first ones who went and told them we don't want your protection. We just want a single line court order which says change of management allow and you will settle directly with the creditors. No concessions. So we have to sit and work out with each of these uh, institutions to take the term loan, term, term loan guys, take a haircut because by that time the interest and everything had piled up. It took time. Again, you have credit with the banks. If they see you are putting in your money and you have had a track record, they are willing to help. I spent a whole day after doing a lot of groundwork over two months, negotiating with nine bankers, all in a room, Coming to try and conclusion, getting them to agree that this is the kind of haircut we have to take. A haircut meaning, you know, you forget about interest of the past, you have to, you know, principal if you have 100 crore, uh, 10 crores, you only get 7 crores at the end, you will give me some time to pay, stuff like that. And the working capital guys also say you get it after 3 years, but you give me new working capital to run the company, stuff like that. And then when the end of the day we had an agreement, walking out of the room and I was thanking those people. And one gentleman, I don't remember his name, he was from the State Bank of India, uh, restructuring itself. By the time the case had moved to uh, the defaulters list and stuff like that. And he was a very negative kind of guy. But this I expect that people who are in the restructuring cell are people who are very gross and pessimistic. And, you know, they see all kinds of negative stuff in the world. And at the end of the day, Shakespeare said, Mr. Patel, yes, you are trying very hard, but I'm telling you, you are going to lose your money and we are going to lose ours. <laughs> <laughs> so I turned and told him, Mr. Daniel, you start off the business thinking nothing is going to happen, then how will we succeed? 
give us a shot. Say, yeah, yeah, now we have a dream, we'll give you a shot. But I'm telling you, one year down the line, you'll be sitting on my table <laughs> and asking me for confession. Four years down the line, I went to them with a dividend chain. <laughs> Say, profits, dividends, here and now. Ah, what do you say, you know? That happens once in a while. You're going to have to eat and stuff like that. <laughs> but you get all the time. So that's how it happened. Now, that's how you put it together. Now, between putting the plot together on paper and then actually executing, hundreds of things happen. Completely unpredictable. Now, I just go back to that a little later. The performance after that, from 2001 to 2003, they've never made more money than they made more money than they have ever in the past. And in fact, in 2010 or something, they made more money than that kind of answers. And we had so much money we didn't know what to do. We went and invested in the windmills <laughs> to save the tax. <laughs> Stupid decision, but okay. We did it. You know? So they've got two windmills or something in Maharashtra, supplying electricity to MSE. So these kind of decisions get taken when you have too much money. You know, that's no problem. And, uh, the cycle has come back, but that's another story. I won't go into it in the next law. What is happening in the immediate uh, future? But I will talk to you about the implementation. Now, these are the four points I'm going to talk to you about, and I want you guys to respond. First point figuring out, figuring out your What got DSL into a mess? Company started exactly at the same time. <laughs> and 20 years later, one was buying the other one. Same circumstances, similar markets, similar kind of business. If you were in that kind of situation, what would you do? Imagine yourself back in the 90s, 91, and one was saying has changed your life. <laughs> How do you react? You are running a company, you are very comfortable, you've got this duty protection of 100%, and suddenly he gets up the stroke of the pen saying, sorry, it's coming down. In five years, it will be 30%. After that, it will come to Asian normal, you know. <coughs> what would you do? Anybody, any idea? So, you look into more markets, I mean, alternative markets, so right? Yeah. Trying to restructure as soon as we get to know how. When this is <coughs> like if I'm in 91, then you start planning accordingly. So that volume. You look at new markets. Yeah. New markets outside, so your volumes go up. Yeah, definitely. Good point. Any other ideas? Okay. To cut a long story short, I think we have only about 10 15 minutes left. So, <laughs> what did I have my we looked at it and said we have no clue, and at that time, literally, we had no clue what the world market of Ethereum means, or at least uh, an elephant means. So, what's the best way to find out? Let's start exporting. So, the boss took a trip around the world and found a few markets with his contacts, and we started exporting. Obviously, we made a loss in most of the transactions. One thing we learned from there don't sell in Lire. When the freight is in dollars. <laughs> so, you learn about currencies and how they fluctuate. The Italian area went down with you, the dollars fell in, and our freight cost was more than the money we were getting for the Italians. So these kind of things happen, but we learned a few things. That we had one group of products which was competitive in the marketplace. That was Italians. And we said, why is that competitive? Because that product uses a raw material, which was ethyl alcohol, which in India was agricultural based. It's a byproduct of the sugar industry. You get cane, you crush it, you get sugar, you get molasses on the side, and of course the cane goes into molasses. The molasses is then fermented and you get ethyl alcohol. Now, ethyl alcohol and in India, because sugar industry in India is now the third largest industry in the world. US, of course, US has corn, so it's a mix. Then Brazil and then India. 
And so we had a raw material source here, which would at best be international price, I mean at worst case be international price, at best it would be a version of So we had a raw material source and a strength which we built on. So what did we do? We took that particular group of products and did what we said. Increase the capacities of those. We built a new plant with bigger capacity, debottomated it to focus on that. This next thing we did was we'll look at new markets, exports, because we had that capacity in the Indian market as well. So we started exporting to Europe. The next thing we did was that, you know, in a chemical industry, 80% of the business is business to business. It's hardly any consumers. Only 20% of the business in the chemical, of the 4 trillion kind of size of the chemical industry globally. Maybe 3.5 trillion is only companies to companies. So, you are making a product, give it to somebody who is using it around here, making another product, who is making another product. So we started what we did that and said, okay, there's a whole range of products being made out of our products abroad, but not yet in the country. So we said we'll go into those derivatives. So we started this new division or whatever we want with one marketing guy and three chemists and uh, a little bit of equipment. Most of it's subcontracted out. And we started this derivatives business. Today it's 30% of our company. But that was the idea. Okay, there's one precaution we took there. When you do that derivatives, make sure you're not cutting into your customer's business. Because he's also making a derivative of the product. So if he realizes that you're going to compete with him, then that business of faith and trust is gone. So he must remember, he must realize that you're not his competitor. You're his supplier and not you're on his side. So be careful of that unless you have a strong cost advantage. In which case you need to convince that customer that look, I have a strong cost advantage, I have an advantage over you. I will give you the end product, or one stage before that, and you go and sell the market. Keep the customer, don't lose it. So that's what we did, and that's how we did it. So, how do you figure out your strength? Best way to do it is to compete. Compete in the world you know. You'll either win or you lose. If you win, sometimes you don't know why. But if you lose, you certainly know why. <laughs> but that's the only way to learn what your this is. Compete. Get there in the marketplace and compete and you'll learn. And keep your mind open. Look for new markets. Try and do new things. Always. One of the differences between diamonds and alcohol is even in 1983 when we were making losses, we had a PhD in chemistry and a chemist and a little section of the canteen, the other canteen, which we call the R&D. We said he will develop new products. And we did. And we did products for ONGC. We were on that import substitution thing because you, you, all you need is a clever uh, chemist and a clever this thing and a few engineers and you do it. In, except the initial technology we got from US. Alkyl has never bought technology. We have now more than 100 products, all developed in our labs. And all engineered by Indian engineers, or we are proud of it. We may have spent a lot more money than needed. We may have made a lot more errors than required, but that's how we work. But those errors would have been cheaper than if the errors had been made in the US. Because our manpower is cheap. So, one of the things we did was we innovate. The next is spotting the opportunity. I just told you the story of diamonds, how we lowered the cost of raw revenue, got more markets. That thinking process, not just having a cup of tea and saying, oh, okay, well, this doesn't work. Well. Asking, why is it not working? What can you look at to get this, to make it attractive? Go into the details and you'll find there is something which you can change. Any project you find is opportunity. Something that you can bring to an opportunity which you can change. And that's what you need to do. Finally, the importance of due diligence and the importance of micromanagement. I 
tell you three or four examples of what happened here afterwards. Due diligence. One is, in due diligence we did study it and they had, if you, if you remember I told you they had invested in a UP company called Hindustan Biotech to make the fantasy. That company was in UP, since this company was in a mess, they had not invested there, so that company was in a mess and it was a subsidiary. And of course, in that sense, it comes with the whole balance sheet, you have to take that. So, I said, let me go and have a look, went to Delhi and some one hour from Delhi in UP, <coughs> beyond, uh, something called Sekundrabad in UP. And I there after that. I saw the bank, it was just about ready to be commissioned. But it was in the back of Beyond, technology was going on. I came back and told the Diamonds people that the time will be there next to In this part, this part needs to be right now. And I got a little more suspicious when the UP state uh, fellow who was on the board of that company took me out to lunch and said, Saab, we'll back you, start the company. Don't worry. Nishchint rahiye, kuch nahi hai. What mission got me thinking that hey, this guy is saying that don't worry, is the time to worry. <laughs> so I asked for all their documents, especially their domain names. And it was not on the balance sheet, which is a strange thing with auditors, don't trust any auditors, don't trust any managers. They mess up bad. They have not put contingent liabilities saying that there is a guarantee from diamonds for the loan of HP. It was not showing on the balance sheet anywhere and not in the projections. But when we looked at the documents, which came after much struggle and fight, there it was, black and white, signed by the managing director of diamonds, that uh, you know we will guarantee the loan of which was six costs. The old deal would have gone. When I ran up the chairman of uh, CMX, Dinesh Bhai Patel and Kevin, but he was not a long term relation. <laughs> But my father and my so it was a strange this thing. They were on the board of some other company together. And uh, he said, I told him that, that's why I asked him, you've got a, he said, an impossible process. I've got certificate from CC Choksi and I've got the lawyers certifying it. How can I do it? I said, okay, you go back to your office and ask for this document and look at page 32 and then tell me, give me a call back. But if it is there, this deal is off. He called me back and said, you're right, this is there, but what do we do? I said, that's up to you. You take that company, you take the debt and do what you like. But by that time, we had got so far into the deal and he was hoping it to be off his hands. Because they also had a reputation to keep. They didn't want to close the company. The simplest thing for them would have been to close the company and put everybody out on the streets. Forget about it. They, they had a liability of about 90 lakhs, they would have had to write off another 2 3 crores and whatever they invested. But they had a reputation also. And we knew that they wanted to keep that uh, reputation of them. And uh, say, so okay, we'll take this company. So one of those deals, and that also what happened was that. After all this, IDBI had become hopeful because their money would come back. So when I went to IDBI and said there was a meeting, in, as I told you, that one day meeting with the bankers. Four days before that, I went with uh, IDBI with the chief heading the whole consortium and told the general manager, I am not coming to Amdala because this has been discovered and this is a liability we don't want to take. And uh, he said, no, 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 how can you do this? I got everybody organized. But come now, so I said, why should I come? There's no point in the world. He said, no, no, it's just a matter of uh, airfare. I said, said, Mr. Basu, if you want, I'll come. It's just a matter of airfare. But you have to convince Syntex that they are paying this liability. Because they were the lenders to Syntex. They put their uh, and they were lenders also. Because what had happened with Syntex was that they had big plans. <laughs> And they had bought Soros funds, John Soros' Indian fund, given the money to invest in their company. And one of the conditions of their investing was they would get out of the specialty. You will stick to